Okay, so I heard there's one question that we had now that we're getting started. Yes. What was your question? Um, I was confused with the citalopram, s mm -hmm. um, and the conversion. Yeah, so citalopram is the racemic, racemic mixture, right? So 50% of it is s already, right? So 40 milligrams of citalopram would be equal to how many milligrams of s 20. 20, right? Because half of citalopram is escitalopram, right? So if I had a patient who's on 10 of escitalopram and I needed to convert them over to citalopram, it would be 20. 20 milligrams. Yep. So you can do that conversion. So similarly, if you were to look at something like uh, albuterol, and then there's leave albuterol. All right, so albuterol is going to be the racemic mixture, and leave albuterol is just one of the enantiomers. So basically, to go from uh, a dose, say, of uh, 2.5 milligrams of leave albuterol would be equal to how many of albuterol? Five, right? Yeah, 2.5 to 5, right? So you can always do those kind of conversions when you have drugs that are enantiomers of uh, receiving mixture. Okay, any other questions? So, Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay, yeah, so so the main alpha receptors that are responsible for controlling blood pressure are namely the alpha-1 receptors, right? So those on the vasculature, those are uh, agonized by things like epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine, things like that, um, that will cause constriction of the blood vessels. So if I have something like a tricyclic antidepressant that is sitting on those alpha-1 receptors and blocking it, that would lead, the, even if my brain was sending out, or sending out more norepinephrine to help increase blood pressure if I'm like standing up or something like that, um, it's not going to be able to interact with those receptors because they're already being occupied by the TCA. Hmm? Um, well, clonidine works by agonizing the alpha-2 receptors. Right? Those are those ones that are uh, uh, responsible for that negative feedback loop. So by activating that, that actually uh, prevents more norepinephrine from being released. Any other questions from last week? Yes. Yeah, so you're going to find that like a lot of the different SSRIs are going to have kind of, um, they're metabolized by kind of a number of different SIP enzymes. So some of them will be like 2C9, some will be 2C19, some will have partial 3A4. You'll find that different drugs may have, uh, may be able to be metabolized by multiple types of SIPs, right? So it just depends on the drug. And so it's not as clear cut as like, oh, this one is metabolized by 3A4, so watch out 3A4 uh, inhibitors on that one. Clinically, it's um, you're going to find that even if you were to inhibit one of those, you're going to have other SIP enzymes that could take over, right? So it's just really important to look at those interactions when you're when you're prescribing, right? So just kind of look it up beforehand and say, okay, is there any major interactions here? Maybe if I had multiple, you know, 2D6 inhibitors, maybe that'll affect um, this, you know, this antidepressant or something like that, but it's not as clear cut as you'd have like with uh, the symphostat, you know, symphostatins of the world, where it's like you inhibit three, four, you're more likely to see hepatotoxicity, rhabdo, stuff like that. So with SSRIs, it's just the hmm? Yeah, just be cognizant of the drug list. Look for those interactions. Like I said, always run it through a checker beforehand, um, just to make sure you're not going to cause any big. Because you know, usually they'll they'll grade those interactions by like uh, kind of like the pregnancy categories, like A, B, C, D, and X, right? So X being like you absolutely do not want to combine these drugs. Um, D being like it's probably a bad idea to do, it. and C be like oh maybe you can like monitor therapy and, and watch. A lot of those interactions will be B's or C's, which kind of a moderate to you know who knows if we'll actually see any clinical differences because of that. Any other questions? Okay, so moving on, uh, we'll talk about our antipsychotics. Uh, we'll probably finish up a little early so we can do any kind of mini review if you guys want uh, while we're here, and then the test will be next week. It'll be fun, right? Yay! Okay. Um, so schizophrenia. Do you guys know what schizophrenia is? What is that? I don't. Yep. A lot of people think yeah, it's, it's split personality disorder, but not really. You're going to find that it's, that's not probably the, the technical description of it. Um, it's really more of this uh, issue of having um, positive and negative symptoms and, and some cognitive symptoms as well. But split personality disorder is kind of its own defined thing. Uh, you'll find schizophrenia is a little bit more kind of uh, uh, 
there's a more specific definition for it as we'll kind of look at. Um, but anyway, so there's probably a lot of different reasons why people develop schizophrenia. A lot of it could be genetics, especially when you're looking at patients who have uh, first degree relatives uh, that have schizophrenia, you're, the, the child's more likely to have it. If both parents have it, uh, the child's about 40% likely to get schizophrenia. So there's certainly a genetic component to it. There could be other things like, you know, glutaminergic uh, cascade uh, causing excitotoxicity, uh, you know, due to hypoxia at birth, you know, different things like that could be affecting it. We don't really know why it pops up, though. Um, but we do know that it's related to a couple of different um, neurotransmitter imbalances that we're seeing there. So one of the problems that we have is that, and I'll show you a, gra or a picture that kind of explains a little bit of this, um, a lot of it is related back to dopamine. You're going to see that a lot of our early medications used to treat schizophrenia affected dopamine mainly. Um, so some people thought that there was too much dopamine activity in the caudate nucleus. There's kind of uh, a hyperactivity here, and this will lead to a specific subset of symptoms we'll look at in just a second. Um, and there's also a dopamine hypoactivity in the frontal cortex, right? So what's the frontal cortex really involved with? Personality, executive function is really the big thing, right? So saying like, okay, um, yes, I would like to go do something. I'm going to move my arm. I'm going to go out and get a job. All these different things are affected by the frontal cortex. And that's where you're going to see a lot of issues uh, come about for these patients as well. But... Um, and so also there's these uh, dopamine uh, hyperactivity in the mesocaudate, which is also responsible for these positive symptoms. We'll talk more about those different types of symptoms in just a minute. But uh, there's also thought to be some uh, glutaminergic uh, interactivity here where we're having uh, too much excitatory uh, glutamate activity uh, leading to some problems. And then also there's going to be this issue of serotonin, uh, which we'll look at. Um, and we'll see that some of our newer drugs are specifically going to be working to block the effects of, of serotonin in specific uh, receptor subtypes. Because remember, there's lots of different serotonin uh, subtypes. You know, things like 5-HT1B and 1D are responsible for like causing migraine relief. You know, we're going to find a different subset being responsible here for these uh, schizophrenic <clears throat> symptoms. But um, so this is kind of a complex picture, but I'll kind of walk you through it. So keep in mind that obviously the brain is pretty complicated, right? Anyway, there's lots of neural projections that occur, and you'll notice that um, by inhibiting one type of neuron, that can lead to extra activity in, in that neuron, right? So if you take the brakes off of something, it's going to cause that neuron to fire more, right, for whatever type of neurotransmitter it might be. Um, so if you're looking here, say we have these uh, this dopamine neuron here that's projecting down into the nucleus accumbens, and then also here in the frontal cortex. And so what you can see here is if we end up having too much dopamine activity here, you can end up having uh, some of these positive symptoms we're going to talk about in just a second here. You'll notice that there are other receptor subtypes that are responsible for, for affecting these things like GABA, uh, acetylcholine, things like that. Um, but you're also going to see these projections here to the frontal cortex. And here we mentioned there's going to be a, a dopamine hypoactivity or not enough dopamine activity happening up here in the frontal cortex. What that means is that normally this would be an inhibitory neuron, right? And this would be, uh, so basically by having dopamine activate these receptors here, you would end up having an inhibitory effect here by releasing GABA onto this neuron. So because we have a dopamine hypoactivity, this neuron does not get activated as much. And this means that the, the dopamine projections here get to be more active. Right? So this just is going to be kind of a cyclic problem here. We're going to have too much activity in the nucleus accumbens, too little activity in the frontal cortex, and they just kind of beget one another. So you can see by doing things like uh, having uh, 5-HT, 2-A, and C, if we antagonize this effect here of serotonin, uh, you can end up having more dopamine being released, which will end up having positive effects here by inhibiting that neuronal, uh, neuronal projection. Okay? So make more sense when we talk about how the drugs work in treating those specific symptoms. Hopefully. If not, you'll have lots of questions. But um, so basically what happens with a patient with schizophrenia is that they're kind of losing touch with, with reality and their brain kind of starts to generate its own uh, kind of false reality, meaning that we can have hallucinations. Um, they usually don't have a lot of visual hallucinations, but certainly auditory uh, are going to be pretty prominent here. So, you know, hearing voices outside of their head saying, hey, you should go do something. You should go harm yourself or you should go harm someone else, you know, things like that. Um, delusions usually are going to have some kind of fixed false belief. Like, you know, students really want to hear you talk, so go and teach as many universities as possible. Like, that's a delusion of grandeur you might have, right? Um, and also these ideas of influence, so them feeling like their actions are being influenced by external forces that aren't really there, okay? Um, typically, you're going to have patients, uh, their affect will be kind of flat uh, or inappropriate to maybe responding inappropriately to different uh, stimuli or kind of labile to me, kind of vacillate between the two. Um, and you're also going to see things like personal hygiene suffers because they're not really, uh, you know, their set of beliefs and, and priorities have kind of shifted away from what normal people consider uh, to be priorities. And so things like, you know, hygiene suffers. Um, we're going to find that substance abuse is really big amongst this population. You know, uh, keeping a job and, and doing things like that are, are very difficult for a lot of these schizophrenic patients who, who do not get treated appropriately. But um, 
that also means that they're going to have a lot of difficulty in understanding why it is important they receive treatment. Because in a lot of the cases, they, to their minds, they may think no, nothing is wrong. Right? They may have no idea that there actually is a problem, that there is anything going on with them. Um, so there's really a big problem with decreased medication compliance, which means there's a big relapse in schizophrenic and psychotic breaks where they end up coming into uh, the hospital to be managed, either because they're a danger to themselves or others. It's a big thing we end up seeing in a lot of cases where patients will go off their meds, have a psychotic break, come into the ER where they have to be managed uh, for that, and then they usually get hospitalized or they'll go to a behavioral health center or something like that. Um, they also kind of have an impaired ability to learn from their mistakes, high rates of substance abuse, mainly ethanol, nicotine, but certainly other illicit substances could be involved with that as well. So um, we talk about the symptoms of schizophrenia as either being positive, negative, or these kind of cognitive uh, symptoms. We, uh, as I mentioned a few slides ago, the positive symptoms are usually going to be related to too much dopamine activity in the nucleus accumbens. And then the cognitive and negative symptoms are going to be related to hypoactivity of dopamine in the frontal cortex. So positive symptoms. So the, think of things uh, like things that uh, are there to the patient, but really aren't there, right? So their brain is producing new things that aren't really uh, there. So things like suspiciousness, like them feeling like they're being watched, right? Or like, like your microwave is listening in on you. For anyone that keeps up with politics, huh? Yeah? Topical? Okay. Um, things like unusual thought content, hallucinations, mainly the visual hallucinations, thinking that, uh, you know, the you know someone is talking to them that aren't really there. It's kind of conceptual disorganization. Uh, the negative symptoms are going to be things that should be there but are not there in the patient. So this is where they get that flat affect. Where they're not really responding to, you know, things like emotional stimuli appropriately. Uh, this alogia where they're not able to come up with words for things. Uh, anhedonia. Do you guys know what anhedonia is? Yeah, so inability to really uh, feel pleasure in things anymore. That's a very good description of it. Uh, a volition where they're not able to act on thoughts that they would like, would like to. You know, like, oh, I'd like to go get a job, but they can't really act on those kind of thoughts. Um, and then the cognitive uh, issues that pop up, so impaired attention, memory, and this executive function that kind of overrides kind of uh, everything. So we're going to be looking at drugs that can specifically deal with um, these different types of symptoms based on their mechanism and based on how they're working specifically at blocking different types of receptors. So our goal here, uh, you're going to find that with schizophrenia, uh, pharmacotherapy is going to be a key component of, of uh, therapy. Um, therapy really should be assertive and kind of aggressive in the first five years because you find that patients um, tend to have a deterioration that's pretty gradual. Uh, and if you don't kind of treat them aggressively up front, it's hard for them to keep uh, hold on a lot of their things like hygiene and you know things like going to school or getting jobs and, and things like that. So you want to try to get them early, try to get them uh, as, as well managed as possible. Because um, you know, when, when does schizophrenia usually kind of manifest itself? Yeah, usually in the 20s, yeah. So this is a time where people are, you know, kind of still developing themselves or still kind of finding out who they are, going to school, trying to get jobs, you know, things like that. So this is why it's really important to try to treat them early. Um, and so the treatment really should be individualized. So if they're having a lot of positive symptoms, maybe certain types of drugs are going to be better for them than if they have a lot of negative or cognitive symptoms. Um, and so we should really treat for at least a total of three months to see how they're, they're responding well. Again, uh, having a good you know, therapist and things like that are going to be really, really critical to making sure that they're going to be treated uh, appropriately. So um, you're going to find that a lot of the treatment is going to be um, limited by the side effects that occur with these medications. Again, if you are you know, thinking that, hey, there's nothing wrong with me, I, I don't have any problems, and then they're putting me on this medication where I've gained 30 pounds and you know, all these other problems, you're not going to want to stay on those medications. And so side effects are a big problem with these. So we'll talk about ways that we can minimize those as we go on. Um, and hopefully we can decrease rehospitalization. If we can get them on a good therapy that they are um, you know, adherent to, hopefully keep them out of the hospital. Uh, and then if we can decrease the you know, number of recurrent episodes, increase compliance, and minimize costs, it's all going to be kind of uh, good things to do for our patients. So uh, the first generation antipsychotics that we had, these are older drugs, uh, but the first ones we had worked by specifically blocking dopamine 2 receptors. We talked about these a little bit when we were talking about bipolar disorder, but here we're going to see them, their, their main use. Um, basically, by blocking the effects of dopamine, especially in the nucleus accumbens, you're going to be decreasing those positive symptoms, which means you're going to be... Um, having you know, less of those uh, hallucinations, less of those delusions, things like that, uh, that they're experiencing. And then, again, this is probably the most important thing to be treating when they're having kind of an acute psychotic episode is to really get that under control. And a lot of it's related to blocking those dopamine receptors. 
However, if you're just blocking dopamine 2 receptors, you're going to end up finding that you have a, a risk of actually worsening uh, prefrontal cortex signaling of dopamine as well. Because we already mentioned they're hypoactive uh, in the frontal cortex, so this can actually worsen that to some degree. So that's why you can see things like um, patients becoming more, have more of a flat affect, have more of the avolition related back to strictly blocking dopamine 2 receptors. So, again, our uh, drugs here, the first generation antipsychotics are going to be working specifically to block dopamine 2 receptors um, working in the nucleus accumbens. So, really just working here in this area. Uh, if anything, you're going to have negative effects up here in the frontal cortex. We'll talk about our second generations a little bit later and how this kind of overcome that problem. So, um, adverse effects you're going to be seeing. Uh, one of the problems with blocking dopamine uh, in the brain is that you're going to end up having increases in other types of neurotransmitters and hormones. So one of the big things being prolactin ends up getting increased when you have dopamine receptor blockade. So this is why you can see gynecomastia and menstrual irregularities happening there. Okay. Um, also, by decreasing dopamine uh, activity, you're also going to increase amounts of acetylcholine being released. And so increasing that acetylcholine is going to be affecting um, our, our skeletal muscle tissue, and you're going to be seeing some certain side effects associated with that. We'll talk about uh, acute dystonias being related back to that in just a minute. And when the major limiting... Oh, yes? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Are we actually decreasing the amount of dopamine to reduce or just the effects on the receptor? So... The dopamine is still being produced, it's still being released from the neurons, we're blocking those receptors. Yes, yeah, so you're just blocking the dopamine from actually making it to its site of action. Yep, thank you for clarifying. But, um, so the, the major limiting factor that we're going to run into with uh, the first generation antipsychotics are, are going to be these extrapyramidal side effects, they're called EPS. Um, and so this is mainly related to dopamine blockade and that caudate putamen, and this is going to be the Parkinson's-like side effects you're going to be seeing from this, okay? So you're going to be having the catatonia, the motor rigidity, the tremor that can come about from that. So if they look like a Parkinson's patient and they're on these antipsychotics, it's most likely uh, the EPS that you're finding uh, developing there. And then also in conjunction with that, the increased amount of the acetylcholine is going to cause this dystonia. So you can see these irregular muscle contractions in the face, the neck, and the tongue. Uh, did I tell you about the, the family that came in who are doing uh, street Valium? All right, so uh, one of the cases my, my, one of my mentors uh, told me about in, in fellowship was that a family who they were trying to, is a mother, daughter, and um, father, and they were trying to uh, buy Valium off the street, and that's diazepam, which is a benzodiazepine. They're trying to buy that. Um, <laughs> what they didn't realize is that one of these first-generation antipsychotics, haloperidol, or haldol, had a pill that looked very, very similar to uh, what the Valium looked like. So, of course, they come into the ER, and they're all like, Looking like this with their acute dystonias and can't figure out what the heck's going on. It turns out that while they thought they were getting a benzodiazepine, they're actually were getting one of these antipsychotic agents. Okay, so again, acute dystonia is a very common side effect seen with these um, these dopamine two receptor blockers. Okay, one of the big things you're worried about, and um, we'll talk about how to treat that in just a little bit. But um, other things you can see with what blocking that dopamine intact or having the dopamine antagonism, you see this akathisia. Do you guys remember what that is? Talked about it last week. Kind of excitability, they're kind of this is kind of that uncomfortable in their own skin. Yeah, they want to just want to like get up and move and have too much energy. Um, same thing is going to be happening here. So you see a lot of pacing, a lot of shuffling uh, about. And then one of the the big side effects you worry about with long term use of these first generation antipsychotics is called tardive dyskinesia. And basically, by blocking these dopamine receptors for a long period of time, you end up seeing re upregulation of those receptors and become kind of hypersensitive to dopamine, which means that over long periods of time, uh, you'll end up having this uh, chewing and kind of licking movements that are involuntary that just kind of keep just, you know, just having this chewing kind of motion, uh, tongue protrusions, limb movements, uh, and all of it's related to the, the dose that they're using. So higher doses for longer periods of time are more likely to see this tardive dyskinesia. And in a lot of cases, it is not going to be reversible. Uh, and you're going to see that these are not, even though they have involuntary muscle movements, they're not treated the same way as uh, um, uh, like a dystonia or an EPS-like uh, effect is being treated. Okay, so we'll differentiate between those in a little bit later. So at that point, if they're being upregulated because of chronic use, does, does that mean they're not working anymore for the antipsychotics? You still may see uh, positive effects on, on their or good effects for their schizophrenia, like they still may, may be um, effectively treated from that standpoint. It's just having these other side effects that are starting to pop up now. Yep. 
other effects you can see. Um, these, again, are not going to have a very specific mechanism of action. They affect lots of different receptors. So you can see some alpha-1 antagonism, which can lead to dizziness, postural hypotension, like we mentioned last week. And then also they have some anti-muscarinic effects. We talked about the matter as a hatter, blind as a bat, red as a bee, you know, those kind of uh, side effects you expect to see from that. Um, you're going to find that in uh, some cases, for especially those kind of Parkinson-like side effects, so the EPS, uh, more anti-muscarinic effects is actually protective because you're going to find it actually blocks that uh, increased amount of acetylcholine being released. Um, but you're actually going to find that this is going to be worse for patients with tardive dyskinesia. Because anytime um, you're blocking dopamine, you're going to have an increase in the amount of acetylcholine uh, being released, and vice versa. If I have an anti-muscarinic effect, it's going to cause more dopamine. And so if I were to give uh, something with a lot of anti-muscarinic effects, that actually worsens uh, tardive dyskinesia for those patients. So we'll talk about how that kind of differs based on the drugs that we're using in just a minute. Uh, you can have some uh, histamine 1 receptor antagonism, so you can see some sedation and waking associated with that and these cardiac effects. So some will prolong QT, uh, QTC intervals, some will cause tachycardia, some sodium channel blockade leading to some white complex arrhythmias, um, but that's usually seen more in, in overdose and things like that. The big thing you worry about, especially with high potency dopamine 2 receptor blockers, is going to be what we call neuroleptic malignant syndrome, or NMS. And so this is most often seen with a couple of drugs, mainly going to be haloperidol and another drug called flufenazine. I'll show you a chart in just a minute that has all the different first generation drugs. Um, but it can occur with any of these first generation antipsychotics. Um, basically, what you end up seeing is it, it looks kind of similar to the serotonin syndrome that we talked about last week. So you guys remember what serotonin syndrome looks like? Hyperthermia. Hyperthermia. Yeah, so they'll have some kind of autonomic instability, so usually tachycardia, hypertension. Hmm, yeah. What else? So you have alter mental status and what kind of muscle effects do they have? Get some term. They get, yeah, they usually get uh, increased clonus, especially in the lower limbs, right? So you see some muscular rigidity associated with that. Um, with NMS, this is kind of a, seems like a more severe form of it, but basically they get the hyperthermia, they get the alter mental status, but they also get this lead pipe rigidity, right? So I've only seen this a few times, but basically it's like the patient's like arms are locked out, their legs are locked out. You tell them just relax your arm, just bend your arm. Cannot do it, right? So the lead pipe rigidity. And what do you think happens when you have that occur for a long period of time? Uh, Rhabdo. Right. Rhabdo, get a lot of heat, get a lot of acid, get uh, you know renal insufficiency related to myoglobin precipitating the kidney. So that's something we want to avoid as best we can. Okay. So um, here are the couple of drugs I will point out here. There's a lot of first generation agents. The ones that I have uh, hi highlighted here are gonna be the ones that I will expect you to at least recognize on a test. Seems like I was being a little generous and I only did four, so. Could have been meaner, but I guess I was uh, feeling generous at the time. Um, notice you, you've seen at least one of these before. So we're talking about pro uh, prochlorperazine. You guys remember where we used that at? Yeah, nausea, vomiting, usually you see a lot uh, for headaches and, and migraines and things like that. People use that as a good um, uh, drug for nausea, vomiting. Um, big things to, to notice, like things like uh, chlorpromazine or thorazine is probably the most common one um, that you would have run into in a lot of cases. Have you guys seen the movie A Beautiful Mind, mm -hmm. Russell Crowe? So that is about a guy who is actually um, diagnosed with schizophrenia. He gets put on thorazine, so you can see a lot of the side effects that they try to, to manifest there, or at least try to, to illustrate. Um, so that was a good one because this one um, had some high... You know, had some potency of blocking D2 receptors, but it also had a lot of anti-muscarinic effects, right? So those kind of balance each other out to some degree. When you have drugs that have a lot more dopamine receptor blocking ability, like haloperidol and flufenazine, those are the ones you're more likely to see acute dystonias, and you're more likely to see uh, NMS from, okay? Things like thor uh, thorazine, you're less likely to see that because it's less potent at blocking D2 receptors. Um, but you're also going to have uh, those anti-muscarinic effects kind of balancing it out. So... Um, you know, if you have a patient who has a history of having an acute dystonia to haloperidol, like chlorpromazine is a better drug for them, you know. Um, also, it may not be as potent in treating a lot of those positive symptoms of uh, schizophrenia, right? Um, you're saying haloperidol has more anti-muscarinic effects? No, it has less than oh, okay. something like, yeah, chlorpromazine would. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's why I had one plus there. So basically, um, you, know, you can kind of decide you know, based on how your patient's symptoms develop, you know, uh, what type of drug they need to use, whether a really high potency D2 blocker or some, maybe a less, less potent one. Okay. You're going to see a lot of these problems get sidestepped by using some of our second generation, second generation agents, which we'll talk about in just a minute. So um, this kind of goes along with the last slide. This is uh, kind of comparing the different side effects you're going to run into. So things that have more... Um, 
more antimuscarinic effects, more antihistaminic effects, you're going to see more sedation associated with it. So that's where you see things like chlorpromazine, thyroidazine have a high sedation associated with it. Um, for the most part, uh, things that are high potency of blocking D2 receptors, you're more likely to see things like EPS with. So that's why hyaloperidol, you're more likely to see EPS with than you would just something like chlorpromazine. Okay, so again, kind of compare and contrast. You know, I'm not going to ask you how many pluses did you know chlorpromazine have at blocking muscarinic receptors. Like, I don't really care about that. Um, but noting that things like haloperidol and flufinazine are high potency D2 blockers, what side effects are more likely to cause? Okay, related to that versus something that was a low potency one, also had more anti-muscarinic effects. What side effects are you less likely to see when you have a drug like that? Okay. Um, the atypicals. Those are our second generation second generation agents. We'll talk more about those in just a few minutes. So um, first generation agents, these are really good for uh, positive symptoms, um, but a lot of times the side effects are going to lead to discontinuation. Okay? You're going to need to select your agent based on symptomatology. So again, if they're having a lot of hallucinations, a lot of um, you know, delusions, things like that, like a high potency D2 blocker is going to be the better thing to give. Um, and so uh, these are also very good at knocking patients out, especially with an acute IM doses. So again, very frequently you'll have acutely agitated patients, whether it's an acute psychotic break or not, we'll end up getting one of these high, um, uh, high potency D2 blockers. So haloperidol is a very common one. You give an IM shot in order to knock some of these patients down. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, so how do you treat some of these side effects? If you're having extrapyramidal side effects, you're having those Parkinsonian type side effects, um, which includes things like the dystonic reactions, includes things like the akathisias, typically what you can do is treat with an anticholinergic drug. Right? Usually this means your first generation antihistamines. So use things like uh, diphenhydramine, Right, you know, Benadryl is very commonly used. Uh, we also have some other drugs like trihexphenidyl and benztropine. You guys remember where we saw uh, these other drugs being used? Oh. Use it for Parkinson's, specifically for what? Yeah. For tremor, right, exactly. So again, very similar uh, you know, mechanism here um, by having the anti-muscarinic effect um, due to a relative lack of dopamine activity due to the drugs, um, you, you can treat the side effects the same way here. Okay? Um, if that fails, uh, you can always try using things like benzodiazepines to help kind of calm the patients down from that standpoint. Uh, you guys remember how benzodiazepines work? What's the major inhibitory neurotransmitter in the CNS? GABA, GABA right? They help GABA to work better, right? They open up those chloride channels, hyperpolarize those cells. So you can use benzodiazepines. They help with both like muscle contractions and because they act as skeletal muscle relaxants. They also help kind of cause some CNS depression to calm the patients down. Okay. For the tardive dyskinesia, unfortunately, we can't really do a whole lot about this. Um, this is why we've gotten away from using a lot of the first generation drugs for chronic management of schizophrenia. Um, you want to avoid anticholinergics because that'll actually make it worse because that actually will increase dopamine release and actually uh, trigger those hypersensitive dopamine receptors. Um, a lot of times you can either discontinue treatment, hopefully, but then you worry about your patient relapsing, which can be problematic. Um, sometimes you'll have uh, drug holidays where actually go over a period of time without any drugs. Um, it's not like you send your drugs to Hawaii and then you come back and they're even better. Not like that. But the patients stop taking them for a while. Um, or you switch over to a second generation agent. Right? That's those delusions I'm talking about where I think those drugs are funny and then you get a couple of groans and that's about it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, there you go. Um, so for NMS, uh, the way we treat that mainly, uh, first thing you want to do is discontinue the offending agent. Um, so hopefully they have not continued taking their drug after they started having this occur. Big things to do are to cool and hydrate the patients. That helps to limit the amount of muscle damage being done there. And then we can also use a drug called dantrolene, which acts as a, a muscle relaxant, essentially. Um, also, you'll see this used sometimes for malignant hyperthermia in the surgery setting, but that helps to uh, limit that, that lead pipe rigidity and help them kind of loosen up a little bit. Um, you can also try a drug called bromocryptine, which is a dopamine agonist I know we've mentioned previously uh, in the Parkinson's section. Right? Okay, so this is a good table just kind of giving you an idea of um, what the features of the different side effects look like, um, how they are likely to occur, like you know, what time frame, uh, what the risk factors are, and then also um, what the treatments are going to be. So I would at least be aware of, say, like, you know, give a, you know, say on a test question, you know, I have a drug with um, high potency D2 blocker, which of these side effects are they likely to, uh, to occur? You know, you can say like, you know, dystonias, or you can say, you know, EPS, and how would I treat that? You know, you can use things like, you know, uh, anticholinergic. So just be kind of aware of how to, how to manage those different side effects. Any questions on that? Okay. So uh, those are the older drugs. Now we have our second generation agents, which in general uh, are going to be much, uh, 
I think much better than than what the older agents used to be, uh, mainly because they they lack the tardive dyskinesia effect that you end up seeing there. Um, in a lot of cases you'd have patients, you can look up videos online of patients who have been treated for schizophrenia uh, in the past for a good long time, and the tardive dyskinesia in some cases is actually worse than what the actual disease was beforehand, right? So this is why the second generations have been so monumental in in, in avoiding a lot of those uh, kind of chronic problems. Uh, we'll also call these the atypical antipsychotics. So if you hear that term, that's also what they're being referred to. And they have uh, some small ability to block dopamine 2 receptors, but they're going to be working more so on serotonin, which means they're going to be very few extrapyramidal side effects, meaning you're not going to have really that dystonias. You're not really going to have as much akathisia. You're also going to lack those prolactin effects. You're going to have less menstrual irregularities, less gynecomastia. Um, and they're also going to be much better for treating those negative and those cognitive symptoms. Okay, um, So let's start with dyskinesia. And for the most part, these should be used first line regardless nowadays. Okay. So uh, again, like I mentioned, less affinity for the D2 receptors in the striatal tract, meaning they're going to have less EPS symptoms. Uh, but you're also going to have this added 5-HT2 receptor antagonism. So uh, we'll show that uh, picture in just a second. But basically by stopping serotonin activity there in the frontal cortex, uh, this is also going to lead to um, inhibition of mesocortical dopamine. So uh, if you go ahead and look at this picture here, if I have uh, antagonism here, normally this would be an inhibitory uh, receptor. If I block that effect, I'm having more dopamine being released in the frontal cortex, which means that this is going to be uh, more active, this neuron here, and this is inhibitory, which means you're going to have less dopamine being released in the nucleus accumbens. Okay? So basically by working at a different site, it's able to um, increase dopamine activity in the frontal cortex and decrease dopamine activity here in the nucleus accumbens. So even though it's not blocking a lot of those D2 receptors like a first generation agent would, um, you still end up having some reduction of those positive symptoms. Okay? Yes? So is These are much better at treating positive and negatives. We, like I mentioned with the first generation ones, um, you're more likely to see worsening of the, positive, or of the negative symptoms. It's best at treating positive symptoms, the first generation agents. Yep. Okay, but other adverse effects you're going to be seeing with these drugs uh, includes a lot of weight gain. This is going to be related um, most likely with olanzapine and clozapine. I'll show you a, a chart that has all the different drugs on there in just a minute. Um, so I've seen some patients, like I know um, one of the, the girls I went to school with, she, her husband had uh, suffered from schizophrenia. They put him on olanzapine, and within six weeks, he'd probably gain at least 30, 40 pounds. Like a ton, a ton of weight gain you can associate with these drugs. It may not even be that you're necessarily eating a whole ton more. You're just, for whatever reason, the metabolism just changes, and you just gain a ton of weight. Um, you end up seeing this being less likely to occur with things like zeprasidone and also aripiprazole. And if you guys uh, know back to our depression talk, aripiprazole is one of the uh, second generation agents that has um, been FDA approved for use for treatment resistant depression uh, because this has a little bit better side effect profile for the most part. So you might see that being used with some of your antidepressants. But if you have bigger than a 5% change in weight, typically you need to switch over uh, drugs and use something else. You may find some patients, they only respond to something like olanzapine, and they just have to be on that drug, right? Or something like clozapine, they're just not responding to anything else, and they have to be put on that. So weight gain, you know, is just one of those things you have to end up living with, which is unfortunate, but uh, if the patient's able to, you know, maintain a, a more normal lifestyle for them, then that's better in the long run. You know, so it's just a matter of what their, what their priorities are. You can also cause new onset diabetes in some cases with these patients because they're going to have worsened glucose tolerance. Um, so clozapine can be really bad for that one as well. And then hyperlipidemia. And you can notice how these are all kind of playing into the same role here. The metabolism just kind of taking a, a nosedive. Um, one other thing to note, uh, clozapine. This is really going to be reserved for... Um, very treatment resistant schizophrenia, mainly because it has a black box warning for this eight granulose atosis that can occur. And actually, this has the same kind of program, something like Accutane did, uh, which, you know, that one you had to have the patient and the, and the provider and the pharmacist all kind of register with it. Now, with this one, you're just going to be doing serial uh, CBCs to make sure they do not develop uh, eight granulose atosis. So, again, it's one of those re big registries to make sure that's not going to happen to your patients. So, um, clozapine should be really be reserved uh, for patients who have failed a lot of other things. Um, you can see some QT interval prolongation that can occur here, so that'd be one thing to watch out for. And then you will see some orthostatic hypotension as well. Elderly patients are going to be more at risk for this. Um, they typically get some tolerance to it over time, over a couple of months. Uh, and you see this more likely with IV slash IM doses, right? Um, so nowadays what I'm seeing a lot of patients who are coming in with acute agitation, that may be related to like a psychotic break, um, they're being treated with a lot more of uh, these IM second generation antipsychotics, things like um, uh, zeprasidone, things like olanzapine. Um, and and, and so this is one of the things you can see there with that orthostatic hypotension. 
Um, you do not want to treat elderly patients with dementia with these drugs um, because this is not really the same mechanism as you would see with normal schizophrenia. So you do see increased mortality for those elderly patients, so do not treat them uh, with these second generation drugs. Um, you're gonna see a lot of sedation with these agents, so things especially like quetiapine, which is Seroquel, olanzapine, clozapine, a lot of sedation associated with them. So very frequently you'll dose them at nighttime anyway in order to help your patient kind of sleep better through the night, they wake up and hopefully they're, they're a little bit more functional. Um, can still see some anticholinergic effects, um, so you can see some dry mouth constipation associated with that. And then seizures can occur uh, with clozapine and olanzapine, which probably had the greatest risk. Um, but very frequently, I would run into this uh, clinically when you end up having overdoses of a lot of these different drugs. So they overdose on their antidepressant, on their uh, you know antipsychotic agent, and lots of other stuff. This is where you kind of run into problems with seeing things like the cardiac conduction delays and, and seizures. Um, in general, as far as drug interactions go, most of it's going to be related to the pharmacodynamic uh, interaction. So if you had a patient who was taking benzodiazepines, which a main side effect of benzodiazepine use is sedation, right? You guys are all yawning right now, so like I'm very similar acting to a benzodiazepine. But um, yeah, you can see some synergies in there, um, orthostatic hypotension, anticholinergic effects. Again, all of that can be additive uh, in general. There's not really like a lot of like uh, pharmacokinetic interactions necessarily. Um, but keep in mind, like, you know, if you put them on other dopamine blocking drugs, certainly you can end up seeing things like EPS pop up. So things like metoclopramide or Reglan, which you normally use for what? Nausea vomiting or use it for um, gastroparesis or things like that. You, know, you don't necessarily link that with being a dopamine 2 blocker. Or things like promethazine, you can use for nausea and vomiting. You know? So keep those interactions in mind. So um, here are the, this is probably the most up-to-date list of the second generation antipsychotics. Um, again, just really focus on which ones are the worst for weight gain. It's probably the ones I'd want you to be able to differentiate. Um, but just be aware that you have things like uh, aripiprazole, clozapine, again, Big thing, clozapine is going to be the egg granulocytosis, so really um, be aware of that one. That one's going to be pretty nasty. Um, but you have lots of other new ones, things like uh, iloperidone, uh, paliperidone. Uh, probably the most often ones that I see being used clinically, probably ketiapine or Seroquel. Um, see a lot of or Zyprexa, uh, Risperidone, or Risperdal, it's a very common one. Um, a lot of these are being used in conjunction with antidepressants in a lot of cases for more treatment-resistant depression, even though not all of them carry that indication from the FDA. Okay. Um, so just be aware, uh, notice that all of them for the most part are going to have pretty low effect on EPS, uh, much less than you at least will see with a lot of your first generation agents, right? So that's the big thing with their mechanism is that by blocking the 5-HC2 receptors, um, you don't see as much of that EPS because it's not really affecting dopamine quite as much. Okay. So um, a couple other uh, newer ones you may see out there, uh, Brexipiprazole, uh, Iloperidone, Caraprazine. Um, lots of new ones are always coming out. This is kind of a, uh, a big market. Uh, a lot of patients are getting kind of um, a lot of off-label use uh, for these drugs, so it's kind of a big thing for, for drug manufacturers. So you see a lot of new drugs that are coming out for this all the time. I'll probably have two or three brand new drugs to put on there for, for next time I teach this class. So just to give you an idea how many new ones are coming out all the time. You know, there's like a million ACE inhibitors, like a million ARBs. Like this is kind of like what the new the new hotness is for a lot of that stuff. You just see like new ones popping out all the time. And again, we're having more treatment for our you know psychiatric behavioral health problems. That's a great thing, right? Because again, a lot of times patients went undertreated due to negative stigmas and whatnot. Anyway, and again, um, just kind of give you uh, a comparison of the side effect profile versus your first generation uh, versus your second generation agents. Again. Um, you typically see uh, very similar profiles as far as like sedation goes. Again, the more antihistaminic, more antimuscarinic effects you're going to see, more sedation associated with it. Um, but notice very low effects on, on EPS. Um, for the most part, you're going to see um, you know more weight gain associated with these, and especially things like olanzapine. Um, but keep that 5% mark in mind. If they gain more than 5% weight uh, related to the drug, uh, probably a good idea to switch over to something else. Uh, as far as monitoring goes, again, looking at their weight, looking at their blood pressure, you know, make sure these are not going in the wrong direction uh, for your patients. And then looking, just looking for other antipsychotic side effects. So uh, they're developing EPS. Maybe they are particularly sensitive to these drugs. Maybe they need to switch over to something that's even less uh, high potency there. So keep that in mind. Okay, um, so if you had a patient with an acute 
uh, agitation, acute, uh, you know, psychotic episode. Um, how do we manage those patients? Um, essentially, the first thing you want to do is to decrease those positive symptoms. That's very frequently what causes these patients to come in for treatment in the first place is they are having a, a paranoid episode where they think someone's out to get them, uh, they're about to harm somebody, or they're in danger of harming themselves. This is what frequently is, you know, a family member calls up 911, I need some help, you know, they're, they're a danger to me or, or themselves. Uh, that's usually what brings them into the hospital. So those positive symptoms are usually the first thing that you need to be treated, right? Because if you're just suffering from really bad avolition, like you're not really a danger to anyone, you're just gonna be sitting there like a couch potato, right? Uh, so it's positive symptoms of thinking, oh, someone's trying to kill me, I need to get them first. You know, so that's not an uncommon uh, scenario. Um, a lot of times you may need some benzodiazepines to help calm those patients down, you know, especially if they are, you know, fighting back with you or anything like that. Um, benzos can help to calm and sedate the patient. Um, and very frequently we end up using one of those uh, high potency uh, dopamine blockers in order to help knock them down. So things like uh, haloperidol uh, have been very good for that. Um, we're starting to use more second generation agents as well. So things like olanzapine or zoprasidone are starting to get uh, more IM use uh, or basically reconstitute the vial, give them an IM shot, and that usually puts them to sleep pretty quickly for the most part, which is good to treat those positive symptoms. Yes? Um, is buspirone the same as buspirone? No, we'll talk about buspirone in the uh, anxiety set. Wait, did we talk about anxiety already? We will talk about that in just a little bit. Okay. So don't get anxious. We'll talk about that in just a bit. Yeah. Okay. Um, typically, you're titrating your dose to kind of what's effective for you. So, you know, again, if the patient is nice and calm, that's usually the, the, the goal uh, with that one. Um, typically, uh, you can change agents if you don't really see any uh, improvements within three to four weeks. Keep in mind, some patients are going to respond wildly differently to one another. Uh, regardless of which drug you try. So there's not one gold standard. We're going to start with this one and then go down, on down the line. Based on your experience, how good are these kind of people with actually taking their medications though? Because they may say, oh, I took it for three weeks, but mm -hmm. really they, their other personality or whatever is telling them that they're there. Yeah, um, that, so you run into that problem quite a bit where they're like, okay, you know, um, you know, the voices say, I don't need to use this, you know, I'm, I'm perfectly healthy, and I'll stop taking it, right? So in a lot of cases, they're either in like a behavioral health facility where they're being administered the drugs, usually under like a direct observation. Um, they have family members who are going to be uh, there to make sure they take their medications. Like obviously support is one of the biggest things that these patients can have, uh, which is unfortunately, uh, a lot of them don't end up having that. They don't really have a good family or friend support uh, to make sure they take their meds. So yeah, that is a huge difficulty. Um, uh, and treating these patients. Especially if you have like substance abuse on top of that, especially if they're like, you know, abusing amphetamines or other stimulants, that can completely worsen, uh, you know, the, the risk for, for having these agitation episodes and things like that. So it can be a uh, pretty slippery slope for a lot of these patients. But, um, Again, patients who have uh, compliance issues, another thing you can also try is these intramuscular injections. We actually have some long acting forms uh, where we can give it and that kind of ensures compliance over a course of several months or so um, because they have a, usually it's in an oil base that has a slow release uh, into the bloodstream. So that can be uh, somewhat useful. Um, some of the drugs that will come in those forms include like olanzapine, zoprasidone, haloperidol, they all have availability uh, in that dosage form. So uh, just kind of give you an algorithm of how you might treat some of these patients. Um, so say, you know, you can basically um, stage them based on some of their um, presenting symptoms and whatnot. Um, but imagine you have like a treatment naive individual, we'll say with the first break of schizophrenia, um, usually start out with one of these second generation agents, right? Something like a uh, aripiprazole, risperidone, or zoprasidone, one that has, you know, relatively low effects on weight gain, relatively low sedation. Like these are probably the most benign drugs to start out with for the most part. Um, on the other hand, if they've been previously treated, they had a psychotic, um, or if their treatment is being restarted, um, you can try pretty much any of the second generations besides clozapine. That one you really want to reserve um, for multiple treatment failures, just due to the monitoring that's involved with that. So imagine just getting a patient to take their drug every single day is tough enough. Having them come in weekly for CBCs, very difficult, right? Uh, so that's why you want to hold back on that one. You know, if they've previously been treated with an antipsychotic that did not work very well for them, Side effects are totally uh, intolerable. This is where you might want to switch over and try something different at that point, right? Um, now, at this point, they have not had uh, good um, good effects from this. Uh, they're still having, you know, kind of uh, a lot of symptoms uh, developing from, you know, their schizophrenia. Um, you may need to consider doing some kind of combination therapy in some cases. Sometimes you may need to look at, like, are we treating the underlying depression that's also a problem here? Are we treating their anxieties and things like that um, that could also be kind of uh, playing with their schizophrenia as well? Um, so again, if they've had multiple failures of different drugs, you may need to consider something like clozapine as monotherapy, which is again, like to hold off as, as long as we can. Um, and then, um, 
you know, you may need to, in rare some cases, you may need multiple antipsychotics at the same time. Hopefully you can avoid that just because the side effect profile is really nasty. But again, it's just a stepwise approach. Start with the kind of a, uh, you know, a relatively benign second generation drug. They fail that, try a different one, and you kind of go through your options until they've gotten to a point where they're trying clozapine. If that's not working, then at that point you need to kind of throw them out to a specialist because they need um, probably more help than um, what you guys are, are dealing with, right? Unless you guys are um, become behavioral experts uh, or that's going to be like your your sole specialty, then in which case you probably have a lot more experience than I have. There you go, right? Mm -hmm. I've only been on three or four of them, so I can't really speak to any of the other ones. So. Okay. Um, so uh, for some patients, they may not want to be on, on treatment forever. So uh, if you want to discontinue them, you should do it as a taper. Having kind of a cold turkey withdrawal may uh, precipitate a, a new uh, episode. So you do want to try to taper at least over two weeks or so. Um, and then if they start to have recurrence of uh, symptoms, start at a lower dose and try to gently titrate from there. Um, Typically, as you uh, are switching agents, you don't want to just stop one and start the other because a lot of these have uh, half-lives in, in which you may have some overlap there and side effects. So typically, you want to start titrating one down over two weeks. Uh, and during that second week, then you can start the second generation uh, antipsychotic and start to titrate up. So um, some of the withdrawal symptoms you can see, uh, you can have things like working insomnia because you know, a lot of these are sedative uh, type drugs anyway. Uh, so they may have insomnia, nightmares, headaches, so all those kind of symptoms can be increased when you uh, have a rapid uh, withdrawal effect. And again, all of these things may end up precipitating an acute episode, right? So if you're having a lot of nightmares and you're having a lot of insomnia, that can again precipitate one of these uh, acute uh, agitated episodes. Um, so that's why withdrawal is, is uh, you know, we try to have them taper as much as we can. So, any questions on schizophrenia? All right, I'll give you guys a 10-minute break. We'll come back, uh, cover the rest of this, and then do uh, any review. Okay, uh, so any questions on antipsychotics? Okay, great. All right, so we'll move on to our anxiolytics. Uh, we'll do this, and then we'll do ADHD, and then we'll be finished up with this section. So, um, there's lots of different anxiety disorders. Uh, you have things like generalized anxiety disorder, social anxiety disorder. Um, I probably have at least, you know, seven or eight of these, I feel like, but that's okay. Um, did I tell you my, my CDO joke? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay, yeah. So, um, also short-term memory loss. I can't remember what jokes I've already told you guys, but anyway, PTSD, you guys will all suffer from that after this class. So, I mean, lots of different things going on. Um, specific phobias can all be, you know, classified under, general, uh, under anxiety disorder. So, lots of different um, ways that this may manifest uh, in different situations. Um, we know this is probably related back to this kind of maladaptive response to different stress stimuli. So again, we're having kind of an exaggerated response to things like norepinephrine, serotonin, and also have maybe have some underactivity uh, of GABA. And so this is important because you're gonna see a lot of our drugs targeting these neurotransmitters uh, specifically. Could be also related to some HPA uh, axis abnormalities that could be occurring as well. So it could be kind of a multifactorial um, kind of uh, problem here. But um, it's important to realize that certain drugs can cause anxiety. So if you're having a patient who is saying, oh, man, I'm just, you know, I'm really anxious about all this stuff, you know, and nothing else has really changed, maybe it's medication-based. You know, so go back and look at things like their antipsychotics. Do they have akathisia related to that? Maybe that's what's causing their anxiety. Um, sometimes digoxin toxicity, which we use digoxin for what? Heart. For the heart, what specifically? Uh, to help it pump better. To help it pump better in cases of? Heart failure. Heart failure and sometimes? AFib, yep. So sometimes you see, yeah. So uh, if you have too much digoxin on board, sometimes that can manifest as anxiety. Certainly stimulants and pathomimetics, you know, so we'll talk about our ADHD drugs in just a little bit, and that'll, you know, be another source for anxiety in some cases. Hallucinogens can be a big one. Um, and so just be aware of that, especially uh, uh, drug withdrawal as well. So, you know, if they're a chronic uh, alcohol consuming, consuming patient and they stop cold turkey, that can cause rebound anxiety. Opioids can do this. Benzos can do this. Uh, so lots of different reasons for this. And it's important to try to, to pick those out to see that what is the contributing factor so that you can try to minimize that as best you can. But um, obviously, supportive therapy is going to be the, the first line treatment. Uh, a lot of cases, thing, you know, like I mentioned with uh, depression, you know, a lot of these are go uh, anxiety and depression go hand in hand. So a lot of the same therapies are going to be very useful here. If you need pharmacotherapy, a um, couple different ways we can utilize this. So one for acute anxiety. So for instance, if you had a patient who was having like an acute panic attack, this is how we would treat them. And typically that'll be or their benzodiazepines. Okay, um, you're going to have more chronic management of anxiety. That's going to be helped by antidepressants. Okay. Uh, and then uh, some alternative agents, sometimes we can use these, uh, and that'll include our Buspron or Buspar, and then also sometimes second-generation antipsychotics. Okay, so we'll get more of those in detail in just a minute. 
So uh, antidepressants, these are going to be pretty effective for uh, both acute and long-term generalized anxiety disorder. Um, so again, uh, antidepressants are not going to be good for an acute panic attack, but they can help to prevent an acute panic attack from occurring, right? You mentioned how long do these take to really kick in? Yeah, so like three to six weeks before they really become effective. So in regards to like which one of these drugs is going to work quick, most quickly, this is not going to be it, right? Like the patients need to realize that this does not fix your anxiety off the bat. It's just going to hopefully help you, um, allow you to cope better with your anxieties and hopefully allow you to uh, prevent some of these acute uh, occurrences from happening. Okay. Um, some of the ones that will have FDA approved indications include things like vindolafaxine, duloxetine, which are what type of antidepressants? Are they SSRIs? Not TCAs. They're not SSRIs. SNRIs. Yeah, so those are serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. Uh, things like paroxetine, escitalopram, which will be our... SSRIs, right? Um, so again, any of these can be used off-label, um, but these are just some of the ones that have uh, FDA-approved indications. Sometimes you'll see things like amipramine, uh, which is a TCA, might be used as a second line. Um, but again, as you get uh, farther back in the lineage of antidepressants, you're more likely to see those side effects. SNRIs, SSRIs are going to be your best uh, bang for your buck at this point. So again, we don't really know why they're working for anxiety. We don't know why they work for depression, but maybe um, they're helping to activate some of these stress adapting pathways. You know, uh, how it's been described to me for some people that you know deal with a lot of anxieties, they're like, yep, I still feel, you know, I still know that that thing is happening that makes me anxious. I just don't really care about it quite as much. You know, it's just kind of like, you're just like, ah, whatever. Just allowing you to better kind of uh, deal with those kind of stresses. Um, again, it takes several weeks to work, so really let your patients know that this takes time. Still stick with it. Um, and and uh, adverse effects, we already mentioned those previously, so they still hold true here. Uh, but benzodiazepines, again, these are going to be working by potentiating the effects of GABA. So these are going to be really good for acute panic attacks, just like benzos are also good for acute seizures, right? Because they're helping to hyperpolarize those neurons by allowing more chloride to flow in and preventing them from having action potentials. Okay. So again, benzos uh, do not uh, replace GABA. They simply make GABA work better by helping these, uh, these proteins to change their conformation and allows the binding to happen more easily. So um, big list of benzodiazepines that are available to us. Um, the first one we ever had was chlorodiazepoxide or Librium. Uh, that one is very frequently used for uh, prevention of alcohol withdrawal. So if you ever see that being used, uh, that's what usually what it's being used for. Um, some of these are going to be more often used for prevention of seizures. So things like clobazam, uh, clonazepam, we see that very often used for prevention of seizures in children. Um, but certainly things like your Xanax. Anyone know what the street name for Xanax is? Zanibars. Yeah, Zanny bars, right? Because they actually came in these little kind of, they look like little Tetris pieces, the, the four four block ones. Um, so, the, you know, you get your Zanny bars that look like that. Um, diazepam or Valium. Um, we saw that one being used for acute seizures as well, but this one can frequently be used for, for anxiety. Um, uh, I have a couple of these starred here, uh, things like lorazepam, oxazepam, and triazolam. Uh, also, temazepam. These are the lot benzodiazepines. Um, these are ones that are going to be better for older patients. They either don't have any active... Um, metabolites, or they're going to be more water soluble, meaning they're uh, better eliminated through uh, the kidneys, which means they're not going to be sticking around as long for these elderly patients. Yes, sir. So you would prescribe these for like when they're having an acute attack? Like a lot of, yeah, they can be used for acute attacks. For like long -term, like every day type you don't want them to use it like around the clock every single day. Um, so for instance, if I was treating a patient with clonazepam for seizures, that would be something I'd say, okay, you want to take this three times a day, uh, every single day, right? Because you're preventing a, a possible seizure from occurring. Here, for generalized anxiety, for an acute panic attack, that's where you use it as needed. Right? So hopefully they're not using it every single day, otherwise you probably need to readdress what's going on in their life. Which ones were good for the elderly? The ones that are starred there, so the lorazepam, oxazepam, temazepam, and triazolam. Those have relatively short half-lives in comparison to some of the other ones. They're also uh, more water-soluble, they get eliminated more easily, so the lot uh, benzodiazepines, those are better for elderly patients. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so I see a lot of clobazam and clonazepam. Uh, I see that more for seizures in kids, um, but sometimes you may see it used for anxiety as well. And again, some of these um, you know, can be used IV uh, for acute anxiety, so things like midazolam, diazepam, lorazepam, those are available IV, so you can use those for acute management of, of agitation or anxiety. Um, but a lot of these other ones are available orally as well that you can utilize for, uh, at home you know, for the patients without you know, their IVs. you have a question? Okay. 
All right, uh, other uses we mentioned seizures, we already talked about um, uh, neurology, so we knew about that. Acute agitation uh, as a muscle relaxant, so a lot of patients with spasticity issues, you can use this here, uh, and also just for sedation. So again, um, often, hmm? yeah, so we use, uh, we use um, uh, Benzes very frequently for acute procedural um, sedation. So imagine um, a little kid putting them into an MRI. How easy do you think it is to keep them still? Impossible, right? So unless you papoose them and, and you know basically tie them down to the stretcher, it's not going to work, right? So a lot of cases you need to use things like um, intranasal doses of things like uh, midazolam. You can use oral doses of, of Versed, things like that, in order to help uh, calm them down and keep them as still as possible. So uh, yeah, we use these pretty frequently for procedures like that. But um, again, uh, a lot of the different uh, factors with the different uh, benzodiazepines are related back to the pharmacokinetics. Some are going to be more uh, lipid soluble. Some are going to be more water soluble. Again, we like water soluble ones for our elderly patients. They can clear those a little bit easier. Um, but things like diazepam and chlorazepate, they use cross the blood brain very, very easily. So they work very, very quickly. Um, they're going to be working within 30 to 60 minutes at least by the oral route. So those are very good for acute agitated episodes or anxiety episodes. Um, Keep in mind, you know, some are going to be available IV. A lot of the ones I mentioned are all available PO as well, so you can utilize those at home. Um, a lot of these are going to be metabolized by CYP3A4, so be careful with those interactions. If you have an inhibitor or an inducer on board, that can interact with those. But again, we like things like lorazepam and oxazepam because those don't get metabolized by 3A4. So again, older patients on more medications, more likely to have a CYP3A4 inhibitor on board. Again, we like to avoid interactions whenever possible. Um, Patients with liver dysfunction or drugs that have uh, active metabolites, those again are going to have a longer duration of action, especially if they have organ impairment, if they have impaired clearance. So just be aware of that. Obviously, uh, adverse effects wise, CNS depression is going to be the biggest thing. So you're going to see uh, sedation, drowsiness, ataxia associated with that. You're going to have a lot of uh, tolerance developed to these drugs over time. So you can see patients who may need to be on escalating doses based on their tolerance to it. It may not be working for their anxiety as well as it used to be. Um, very similar tolerances as you would see to alcohol and things like that. You can also see things like memory impairment. Um, when I mentioned paradoxical excitation, do you guys know what that means? Yes, yeah, so you take it and you imagine it making you more sleepy, but it actually makes you really excited. Um, so in some cases in children, you may have a paradoxical excitation that can occur for them. Um, a lot of cases you just have to give them more benzos and that usually ends up calming them down. Kind of similar to when you're drinking alcohol and you have like one drink or two drinks and you're like, you're more socially, you know, um, uh, you're more friendly and talk to people and lower inhibitions, but then you get like four or five or six drinks and then you're just on the, on the floor. <laughs> that, that kind of thing happens with benzos as well. Not that you guys should ever drink ever. So the memory impairment is just like while you're on, right? Typically, yeah. So you may have some anterograde amnesia, so similar, similar to alcohol, because again, alcohol is working the same way to make GABA uh, more effective, right? Um, so same thing's happening here. So you're going to have that some of that anterograde amnesia. So that's why you frequently see like benzos and like opioids given together, uh, especially around a procedure time. The patients don't even remember what happened preceding or going into the procedure. Yep. And again, you're going to see synergistic effects with uh, um, other CNS depressants, muscle relaxants, ethanol, all that sort of thing. Uh, I knew some girls in college who said, oh, I'm a really cheap date. I just, you know, I take a benzo and then I have one drink at the bar and then I'm good to go. I don't have to worry about drinking a whole bunch. It's like, oh, okay, okay. We did not have that term back when I was in school, unfortunately. I said, that, that sounds like a bad idea is what I told her, but anyway. <laughs> And then I'm married. I'm just kidding. No, I didn't. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Anyway. Um, so uh, withdrawal effects can be really bad from benzos as well. You don't want patients to stop taking benzos cold turkey because of the fact um, this is for chronic use of benzos, right? It's not for like a one-time procedural sedation kind of thing. Um, but they can have uh, rebound agitation, tremor, sweating, tachycardia, even rebound seizures in some cases. So you got to be really careful with that. Patients who are on higher doses for long periods of time. Okay, um, very similar to how you can see withdrawal seizures from alcohol, same thing can happen here. Because again, you're by constantly agonizing those GABA receptors, what do you think they do? They upregulate or downregulate? Downregulate, right, because you have too much activity. So then when you take that effect away, all of a sudden you have less receptors for the GABA to interact with, and that's where you can see excitation. Okay. So, um, yes, ma'am. Um, so I'm a little confused because you said this is for acute use, but then you're saying for long term chronic, you're just talking about seizures, right? Well, yeah, that could be, be yeah. So that could be for patients who um, end up using it in the long term for these acute agitate or acute anxiety attacks, right? So that is okay. Like people take this every day for their anxiety. Some people, yeah, it may. So if they're not very well controlled, or if they are self medicating or things like that, they may end up taking every single day. And those are the patients you have to worry about withdrawal from, right? 
And again, a common co-ingestion with a lot of these benzos is going to be alcohol, so that can be also synergistic there. You can see withdrawal from both of those, which can be problematic. So, um, yeah, so keep that in mind. Um, so some other adjuvant agents you can use for anxiety include things like buspirone or buspar. This is a non-benzodiazepine anxiolytic. Um, it doesn't really have any, any anticonvulsant properties, no hypnotic or dependence properties. So um, again, if you're looking at controlled substances, uh, benzodiazepines, you guys know what schedule benzodiazepines are? Two, like three, two, three. Those of them are four. So you a lot of fours on there, right? So a lot of the benzes are C4s, I meaning they're still controlled substances, right? Because there is abuse potential. You can become addicted to them, and you can become dependent on them. Um, however, buspirone is a non-benzodiazepine. There's no um, dependence effects. So this one is actually non-controlled, okay? Um, so uh, very frequently, this is going to have kind of inconsistent effects. So uh, usually you're going to see it as an add-on drug uh, for generalized anxiety disorder. It still takes some time to kick in, so about two weeks plus. Uh, so just be aware that it's going to take a little bit of time for them to, to get the effects from this. We don't know the full mechanism for how this drug works, but it's thought to be related to some serotonin uh, 1A agonism, um, which may actually inhibit further firing of serotonin. So that could be one mechanism for how that works there. Um, it's metabolized by CYP3A4, so be aware of that interactions. But other than that, it's pretty well tolerated. This one's a pretty good add-on drug because you don't really see a ton of um, synergistic adverse effects or anything like that. It's kind of uh, benign for the most part. So beta blockers. Why should I use a beta blocker for anxiety? Yeah, so basically what happens when you get anxious? Like, how do you feel? Tachycardic, sweaty, maybe tachypnic, ventilating. Right, so you're kind of hypersympathetic, right? So your sympathetic nervous system, your fight or flight is really kicking off. So if you can blunt those effects by using something like a beta blocker, just blocking those beta receptors, um, you can end up uh, limiting some of those sympathetic nervous system effects. You see less tremor. Right, because you're blocking the skeletal muscle uh, receptors from being activated, you lower the heart rate, the blood pressure, feel much more calm. You don't really notice those symptoms of having all that anxiety. So this is really good for performance-based anxiety, right? So if you have to go up and give a talk in front of a bunch of people, right? If you have to go do a performance uh, or something like that in front of a bunch of people, this is very good for performance anxiety, okay? Um, so uh, you will see that it's important to make sure you're using the right type of agent and you, the time frame is, is correct, right? So you want to make sure that um, you know, they're not taking it the day before because the drugs are going to wear off by then. They really should be taking about an hour before. And what I would say is that you don't want the first time you take it to be right before the actual performance you're going to go for, right? You need to see how it's going to affect you beforehand. Because some patients, you know, if your blood pressure bottoms out and you're super dizzy, you may not be able to perform as well. Right. Um, so have them test it out beforehand and then, you know, before the actual event, have them take a dose about an hour before. So as a clinician, if a person were to come to me and say, hey, I play the oboe. Mm -hmm. and, um, Did you play the oboe? I played the oboe. Nice. You know, and um, I have a performance on Saturday, let's say. You just write on the script, hey, like, you know. Yeah. So you say like propranolol. Yeah. Propranolol, 120 milligrams. PRN anxiety, you know, something like that, where you say, you know, use as directed, something like that. Um, yeah, so that would be the way to get around that. And that would be a perfectly reasonable prescription. And would you just say, like, would you give them, like, a certain amount for the performance, or would you give them, like, hey, here's 30? It depends. Um, you know, so if you know, like, you're going to the concert season, you're going to have to bust out your oboe, you know, 12 times <laughs> in the next six months, and then you might prescribe enough for, for that, right? Um, just depends. Uh, you know, if it's something where it's a one-time deal, then you may not need to worry about that. So, for instance, like, when I was in pharmacy school, we had a class called pharmacotherapy where you get called on at random to stand up and have to quote a bunch of literature and, and get called on, and it was it was one of the most nerve-wracking experiences of my entire life. Uh, and I had some, some fellow students who were using beta blockers. And I was like, that's performance enhancing drugs. That's not fair. I never uh, partook. Um, but, you know, that's that they were, you know, the whole semester, that, that's what they did. You know, we ended up having a class for two and a half years. So, um, you know, that would have been one they would have been going back and refilling periodically. So. so it just depends on the patient, how they're using it. Do they ever have, like, withdrawals when they don't take care of, or, like, rebound, like, for retention after? Not usually. I mean, um, because, again, if you're only taking it, you know, one hour before a performance, you don't have to do it again for another two weeks. You're not really going to have a lot of those chronic effects occurring. Right? There's not a lot of homeostatic um, changes that are occurring there. Right. Okay. Um, but again, do a test dose beforehand because you don't want them having to, having to bottom out right before the performance, and that would be bad. Is the dosage similar to what you'd be giving for hypertension? Yeah, it could be. No, um, you can start starting out less to see how they respond to it and then go from there. So is there testing at home when they're not in this anxious situation? How is it in determining that it's 
probably not looking at the efficacy. You're just looking for side effects, right? So you're looking for things like, oh, if I stand up, I'm going to get super dizzy. Like they need to know that beforehand. Or, you know, for instance, if it's like, you know, hey, I get hypoglycemic when I'm on the beta blocker. Or like that's something they should know about beforehand. So it's really just for adverse effects. A good question. Yeah. Um, so again, looking at the general approach to anxiety therapy, if it's urgent symptoms, start with a short-term benzodiazepine. So again, short acting is probably going to be better uh, for this. So then something like lorazepam, um, oxazepam, those are good drugs to start out with uh, for you know, two to four weeks or so. And then also, if you're knowing it's going to be more consistent, you know, uh, recurrent anxiety symptoms, like start an SSRI or SNRI therapy at the same time. The benzos will cover them until the six weeks has kind of come up and their their SSRIs are working, right? Um, if it's non-urgent symptoms, just start out with the SSRI or SNRI, you know, uh, and then if they're not having any kind of adequate response, you know, just like with depression, not any one drug is going to be perfect, so you need to switch over and see like, kind of what works for them. Um, and then if they're still not responding, then you can consider something like a TCA, a mipramine might be a good option there. So any questions on anxiety? Okay, something that can also cause anxiety will be our meds for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So um, big things with treatment for ADHD. So again, I'm not going to get a lot into the uh, diagnosis for ADHD. You guys will cover that in other classes, but we probably do it too frequently if I had to guess. Um, being in the PDR, I can't tell you how many kids come in who are on a uh, lot of ADHD medications, it is very, very frequent. So it's like kid comes in with palpitations and, and they're really anxious and stuff. It's like, well, it could be the amphetamines that you're feeding them like every single day. Um, so keep that in mind. Like, keep in mind some of the, uh, this is a very common drug for a lot of kids to be on nowadays. And so this can be contributory to, um, you know, different adverse effects. But um, when treating these patients, it's important to set goals, right? So what your goal should be, you know, is it to sit in a chair for 20 minutes straight? So you can listen to a lecture or something, or is it, you know, to complete their homework, you know, et cetera. You know, talk with the parents, talk with the child, figure out what's going to be best for them. Um, obviously, non-pharmacologic therapy is going to be the best thing you can try. So educational, cognitive, behavioral uh, interventions, if you can. Um, and make sure there's consistent behavioral uh, care amongst different caregivers. So make sure mom and dad are on the same page. Make sure teacher and parents are on the same page, things like that. But... Um, if you want to go ahead and just medicate them, then we got that too. So we got stimulants. Uh, this is our, typically our first line therapy for ADHD. Um, a lot of the drugs we're going to be using are going to be amphetamine based and they are working to one, they can block monamine oxidase, uh, to some small degree. I uh, mean, they're going to be increasing norepinephrine levels, dopamine, things like that. Um, they also will inhibit the reuptake of dopamine and norepinephrine. Right, and then also uh, you'll find that some of the amphetamines can actually increase catecholamine release uh, specifically. So they can actually do the work to increase that release into the neuron or into the vessel, uh, the synapse. So, since you have more dopamine, does that increase your chance of work like Parkinson because you have to figure out more free radicals potentially? Um, not that I've seen. I don't know. If there's any link specifically between um, using ADHD meds uh, long term in Parkinsonism, um, but certainly this is where you get a lot of the. Uh, uh, abuse potential from is related to the dopamine uh, in the reward center of the brain, right? Um, so there's a lot to I'll talk about some of the different ones you have available, but just because a patient fails one therapy does not mean that switching over to a different type of amphetamine is not going to work for them. So they, there is some play uh, amongst the group and you can try different agents within the same class. And then um, keep in mind that uh, a lot of times they're going to be available in extended release preparations. Um, this is useful because kids can only take one dose in a day uh, as opposed to having to take it two or three times throughout the day. A lot of logistic problems come up when kids have to take medications uh, at school. And so this kind of helps to circumvent some of that. Um, and keep in mind, like, you know, what uh, scheduled drug are the amphetamines? Two. Two. Yeah. So keep in mind, these are all have the highest control you can have while still having a, uh, an accepted medical use. Um, so there's a lot of you know regulations around prescription writing, how much you can fill at a single time, things like that. So there's a lot of regulations around these drugs. So the different ones we have, there's methylphenidate. That's where you get like your Ritalins, your Metadate, your Concertas. Um, some of them even come as a patch. So if you ever see the Daytrona patch, that can be useful. Um, basically kind of slap it on in the morning and the kid will have, uh, you know, basically drug throughout the day and you take it off. Um, dexmethylphenidate. Again, just going to be the, one of the enantiomers of methylphenidate. So you can see that with the focalin. And then you'll have uh, mixed amphetamine salts, which is basically a combination of different uh, uh, salts of amphetamine and dextroamphetamine. So we get your Adderall. And then there's also lis dexamphetamine. So this one's actually a prodrug that gets converted uh, to dextroamphetamine in the liver. And anyone imagine why you would need a prodrug for some of these for an amphetamine? No, it actually prevents abuse. So one of the reasons why uh, Vyvanse came around is because if I were to take an Adderall, 
uh, or I were to take a methylphenidate or something like that and extend a release preparation, if I crush that up and I snort it, I get all that drug at one time, right? You get a very nice high off of that, um, very good stimulant effects, uh, feel pretty good. Right? All that dopamine is getting released, you feel great. Um, now, on the other hand, if I were to crush up list amphetamine and I were to snort that, it's not active yet, and I'm bypassing that first pass effect by going through the nose right? or the IV if the patient was doing that. Um, so by avoiding that, uh, you kind of ensure less abuse of the drug, so it gets more likely to be taken orally. Um, but it's a very effective drug anyway, and so you see a lot of patients being put on Vyvanse nowadays. So this is a very common one you see patients being put on. Um, but again, all of them are going to be C2s, uh, so they're all going to have that regulation around it. No, it's just when you snort it, where does the kind of what's the blood flow route um, from the nasal, uh, from the nose on? It doesn't, it doesn't hit the liver yet, right? It takes time, it has to be circulated around before it hits the liver. So you bypass that first pass effect, right? Whereas if I were to ingest a pill or a capsule, a uh, list dexamphetamine, first thing it's going to hit after being absorbed is the liver, where it gets converted over to dexamphetamine, uh, and then it can be uh, effective. But again, all C2s so all have abuse potential, all can develop dependence over time, right? So there's actually some really good uh, reporting out there with some of the problems with uh, patients uh, who are started this as children and are getting kind of hooked on it for life, and it can be very, very um, problematic for them in the long term. So I'd, I'd suggest kind of looking those up. Those are very, uh, some of them are very, very sad stories. Um, but some of the adverse effects you're going to be running into with these drugs are one, reduced appetite and weight loss. Um, so that can be problematic for some of your, especially scrawny kids who are not able to really put on, uh, keep on good weight. Um, you see a lot of insomnia associated with it, so this is where frequently um, a lot of our depressants uh, we're going to be seeing uh, used as adjuvants, get kind of given at nighttime, whereas the amphetamines are given during the daytime to kind of counterbalance one another, and then obviously tachycardia and hypertension as well. Uh, there is a black box warning, uh, so be aware of that for psychotic episodes, hallucinations, and abuse and dependence. So again, all of these are risk whenever you're using any of these amphetamine-based products. They all carry the same black box warning. So um, if they have a history of uh, abuse, uh, substance abuse, probably you're going to avoid these drugs as best you can. Um, and you can have some withdrawal effects. Obviously, they're not going to be the same as you would like from a benzo where you have kind of agitation. This one's going to be more um, kind of uh, depressed uh, mood, uh, very kind of flat affect, things like that, as you can see with withdrawal effects. Um, and there is some concern for growth stunting with children. So that's one thing um, that you may see, they actually have some, some growth, uh, growth stunting uh, with chronic use. It's probably pretty minimal for the most part, but this is why some patients will, uh, some people will recommend using uh, drug-free trials. So for instance, when they are on summer break, you know, take them off the medication, they don't really need it, things like that. Um, some parents are probably like, keep them on it 24 seven, please. Like it's the only thing that keeps them from being a terror, um, but try to, you know, try to be reasonable. So there probably some time where your kids should not be hooked up on, on the meth, right? Anyway, uh, I don't know. I can't say that because I guess my kid's going to be walking around pretty soon, so I might want to get her some stimulants. Just like, calm down. Um, but anywho, so, uh, so the, there are some non-stimulant alternatives. So there are some uh, available drugs. You know, if you're worried about, you know, addiction potential, uh, if they have bad responses to the amphetamines, there are some non-stimulant ones that are available as well. So one of the big ones is adamoxetine or stratera. Again, all of these non-stimulant-based drugs are going to be non-controlled substances. So you, you lose a lot of those regulations around writing prescriptions and things like that. So stratera is a good one. This one is working specifically as a norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. Um, and so this one is also uh, approved for use in adults. And one of the things you're going to see is there's going to be a lot more adult onset ADHD or a lot of more adult patients who are um, presenting with, you know, complaints of in inability to pay attention and shortened attention span and things like that that are requesting prescriptions for these. Are most adults just kids who never got um, possibly. That could be it, or maybe it's something different going on in their life that now they have lost this attention span, who, who can say? Yeah, so they may just be presenting uh, or manifesting it later than, than other people. Because again, if you think about it, people who are starting to become adults now like are probably the ones who were first kind of put on it as children, right? So um, a lot of the older patients, um, you know, a lot of these drugs were not around or available to them. ADHD wasn't as well recognized, but yeah, it's a good question. But um, so as all these millennials start to become adults and, and you know, progress like they're they're the ones who've probably been treated since they were in you know grade school for, for that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, 
So anyway, so uh, adamoxetine, like this one's gonna take longer to work, similar to what you saw with a lot of our other SNRIs. Um, so, so say like two to four weeks or so versus you know one to two hours with uh, is what you'll see with the amphetamines. Um, no abuse potential, which is nice, um, but you will see some adverse effects as far as GI disturbances. You may see some hypertension, tachycardia related to that norepinephrine effect, um, and there is that black box warning, very similar to what you saw with the other antidepressants, a, a suicidal ideation. So just be aware of that. Um, be on the lookout for it. Um, then you can also use an alpha-2 agonist. Um, so the big ones here you're going to see are going to be guanfacine and clonidine. Uh, clonidine is uh, frequently either given as a pill or uh, put on as a patch. Uh, the guanfacine is very frequently given as an extended release preparation. Usually intuniv is the one you're going to see. Uh, I-N-T-U-N-I-V. I apologize for not putting that on, this, on the slide. Um, is frequently given for ADHD. And so, uh, again, these are actually working kind of the opposite mechanism of your stimulants. They're actually decreasing the amount of catecholamine release occurring by agonizing those alpha-2 receptors. Um, as you might imagine, uh, they're not going to be quite as effective as the stimulants are going to be for ADHD, um, but they're also going to be non-controlled substances. There's no abuse potential associated with them, so that can be a good thing. Um, a lot of times you may see patients who are on uh, stimulants in the morning time, and they'll be on these um, uh, depressants at nighttime to help them sleep better, right? So clonidine, guanfacine at nighttime, the QHS, uh, and that way it'll help them kind of come down off the, the amphetamine effects and, and, and sleep a little bit better. But of course, hypotension, sedation, constipation would be the biggest side effects you're going to notice with these. Um, uh, treatment really should be uh, personalized based on the individual patients. They're going to be a little bit different, um, but realize that different dosage forms are going to be better for different patients based on their schedule, based on their adherence, uh, and also other comorbid states, right? So if they're an adult patient, they already have um, hypertension. Uh, that's uncontrolled, you know, maybe an amphetamine is not the best option for them. Maybe using something like uh, clonidine, which can also help to treat their hypertension, may be the best option for them. You know, things like that you have to consider. Um, but basically, for the most part, as long as there's no contraindications, uh, start with the stimulant, and then you can consider to try using non-stimulants, uh, and then also maybe consider some of the antidepressant therapy. There's been some, um, you know, some help with that, especially if they're, you know, their reason that they're in inattentive is due to underlying anxiety or underlying depression, things like that. So, any questions on ADHD? With the stimulants, you talk about like these drugs, do you taper them off? Yeah, a lot of cases you may taper them off um, or just kind of gently kind of titrate their dose down. So say like, you know, one week you're on say 20 milligrams of a drug, you know, one time a day, then go to 10 and then go off of it, yeah. Okay, so this is... The rest of the time is up to you guys for a review. So if you guys have any questions, again, this whole this whole uh, slide set will be the test. Come next week. I know it's a little weird. Um, no, this is kind of it. Yeah, the slides are pretty much a review. I don't know what else I can add to it. Um, so just consider, like, you know, consider your patients, like, you know, if it uh, comes up, you know, what's the best drug for this type of patient? Look at comorbid conditions, look for allergies, look for things like that that may preclude use of one type of medication for another. Um, so, for instance, if I had a patient who had, say, congenital prolonged QT and they needed to be treated with an antidepressant, which one should I avoid? Yes, the talipram, that's the talipram. That'd be a good one to avoid for those patients, right? Um, things like that. Or if I had a patient who had, um, you know, was already overweight, had diabetes and hyperlipidemia, and now is present, you know, needs, you know, treatment for schizophrenia, you know, which one would be the worst option for him? Maybe something like olanzapine would be a bad option, right? So maybe something like Abilify or Risperdal would be better for them. You know, so consider things like that. So look at the adverse effect profile. Because, um, again, it's not specifically like, you know, you know, if I have an African American patient, like this is the best treatment for uh, hypertension for them, right? It's not quite as, as clear cut as that. A lot of this is more you try drugs, see how they respond to it over six weeks, and if that doesn't work, try something else, right? Um, or in some cases, like, you know, bipolar disorder, okay? I try uh, an antidepressant that didn't work, and we try adding another antidepressant, or try another, you know, so there's a lot more kind of free play in, in how you come up with your, your therapy uh, plans. Yes, sir? Um, that is a good answer for that. Calcium channel blockers are also pretty good. Yep. With a JNC8. But if they have diabetes, ACE inhibitor might be better for them, right? Because that's going to be what? <laughs> Kidney protective, absolutely. Right? So consider all of these facts. Any other questions I can answer for you guys? Okay, if you think of anything in the meantime, uh, please email me. I will get back to you as best I can. Uh, and otherwise, I will see you guys after the test. Thank you. Thank you.